The story is told of a father and son who were visiting New York City. And the daddy decided that he and his little boy should visit the Empire State Building. Well, sure, you gotta go there. So they stepped on board the elevator and the doors closed and that thing took off. And the little boy watched as the floors rolled by 10, 20, 30, 40. And the elevator got faster and faster and he got frightened. So he took his daddy's hand and he tugged on him and he looked up at his daddy and said, Daddy, does God know we're coming? Oh, bless his heart. Well, you know, not only does God know we're coming, He has prepared the place and He's coming back to get us to take us there. Today we'll be concluding our study of the book of Revelation with a discussion of heaven. Welcome to Faith for Today. No membership test, no lines of birth or race or accomplishment, a church for people who have made errors. That's what this church is here for. You want a church that's made for sinners, just a whole lot like you, this is the place. There are two groups of people for whom heaven is very real. One group would be the elderly, along with some of those who are facing death very soon. And the second group is children. Children have some very definite ideas about heaven and sometimes some very entertaining ideas. So let's hear from a few children about heaven. Heaven is going to be like, um, it's going to be like you're up there. There will be golden streets. You get to see all the animals you liked and you missed when they were, you know, dead. That there'll be no sin. Mm, good. Have fun. When I get to heaven, I'll see God. You get to fly. Mm, with yellow clouds and mm, houses. I think heaven will be bright, really pretty. I'll be happy. I think heaven will be a place. It's like a great place where Jesus lives, and you know it has gold, flowers never die, ponds, and of course, goldfish, and of course, some different kind of fish that are all colorful, lions, dinosaurs. that we can play with the animals and we, and we can fly and we can do whatever we want to do. Heaven look, would look like no more going to sleep and, and it stays light all day, but you can go to sleep whenever you want. And, and, the, and every kind of animal won't kill you. Petting all the animals? But they'll still be eating meat, but they won't eat the children and all kinds of stuff. I'll get to play together with Jesus. Animals will run all around. There will be a bunch of clouds and the land won't have any thorns or bad animals or snakes. When I want to go to heaven, I want to see snakes. A great place where all the family will live and be happy, no evil, play safe, and of course, you don't get any hurtness. I'll see my angel and he'll have wings. We can talk to our angels. When I get to heaven, I'll meet my angel. Getting to walk around with Jesus, my angel will be part of my family. When I get to heaven, I want to tell Jesus that I love him. Aren't kids great? They're not jaded. They're not cynical. They simply take Jesus at his word and believe what he said. And they look forward to heaven with the greatest anticipation. And I think they also tend to put heaven in terms of things that they understand. That's right. It's like when our oldest daughter, Allison, was very young. We were taking a family drive. She was sitting in the back seat and evidently she was thinking about heaven because she piped up and she said, you know, when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to drive and I'm going to sit in the back seat. 
to her, heaven was very, very real. And heaven needs to be very real to us as well. So let's make it real. Let's join the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church as we sing praise to the God of heaven. Thus far, John has outlined Earth's final hours. He has shown us how things will end, but more importantly, he has shown us Jesus. Jesus is the bridegroom who longs for his bride. Jesus longs for you. He longs for you. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he did so in order that he might prepare a place for us. He said that he would come again to get us so that we could be with him forever. This is what he told his disciples. And now John attempts to put into words the glories that the bridegroom has prepared for you. He tries to describe heaven and the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, what has been prepared for you, the bride. As we study these chapters, it is important that we keep the wedding customs of the East at that time in mind. Remember, the groom, before the wedding, goes to the home of the bride and gives to the father of the bride the dowry. He pays the dowry. The bride stays, stays there. The groom goes back to his father's house and makes preparations, prepares a place for them to live, prepares a place for them to have the wedding feast. The bride stays in her father's house and makes preparations for the wedding. And when all the preparations are ready, they come together. 
and they have the great marriage feast. That's what we've got to keep in mind because what we're studying now are the things that the bridegroom has prepared for the wedding and for you. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. These final chapters describe the things that the bridegroom has prepared for us. Jesus is preparing his father's house for the wedding feast. He is making preparations for his marriage to you, his church, his bride. Have you ever wondered why John mentions in his description of the new earth that there was no longer any sea? You see, when he's talking about heaven, he's talking about a reunion of God's people with God. But that also means that God's people have a reunion with each other. You've lost people to death, or people have moved away and live a great distance from you that you miss. You've been separated from them. Heaven is an opportunity for you to get back together in a way that you will never part again. No parting. Remember where John is writing this? He's imprisoned on the island of Patmos. His prison walls are the sea. The sea separates him from those that he loves. And when John envisions the new Jerusalem and he envisions heaven, he says, there's going to be no more prison walls. The sea, my prison walls, is gone and there will be nothing but uninterrupted fellowship with the people I love, nothing to keep us apart, nothing to separate us. We will always be together. That's why he says it. In his mind, the sea was separation. Just to make sure, sure that John and everyone else understands that we can have confidence that Jesus can accomplish what he's promised, look at verses 6 and 7 of Revelation 21. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Jesus tells us that he is all things. He's the first, the last, the beginning, and the end, and he's everything else in between. He is everything, and therefore he has more than enough power to bring to pass the things that he has promised for you. You hold fast to Jesus, and you will inherit heaven. Jesus also uses every human relationship of intimacy he can think of in order to describe his love for you. Notice that he has called us his friends, his brothers, his bride, his heirs, and now he calls us sons. Every intimate relationship he can envision, he uses to describe his longing for you, his desire for you, his relationship of intimacy with you. He's done everything possible to show us how close he longs to be to each one of us. Then one of the angels who held one of the bowls with the seven last plagues in it took John up to the top of the mountain to show him the crown jewel of cities, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. We're going to pick a few of the verses that describe this city, starting with verse 11. Kind of follow along as I skip through here. It's, it says the city about the city, It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. One gate, uh, on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three on the north, three on the south and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were, uh, were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The, uh, the great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. Undoubtedly, words fail John. He doesn't really have all the words he needs to describe the scene. He's doing his best. He's talking about the brilliance, the glory, the beauty of the city. He's putting it all together. He's sharing with us the precious jewels that he's seen. 
But you know, as you think about this, have you ever wondered why it is that Jesus is preparing such a place of opulence for you? I mean, isn't this a little over the top? Do we really need streets paved out of gold? Do we really need gates of pearl? Do we really need a mansion inside a city that's nothing more than a series of mansions surrounding the throne of God? Do we need all of that? Aren't these things unnecessary? No, not when you're talking about lovers. Do you remember the first time you knew for sure you were head over heels in love? Do you remember that? How much was too much to give to the object of your affections? Was there any such thing as excess? Was there ever too much to give? You wanted to give her the sun, the moon, the stars. You wanted to give it to her all. You may have promised it to her too. And you haven't come through with that either, have you? <laughs> Nothing was too much for her. You wanted to give it all. In fact, you probably embarrassed yourself now that you look back at it more than once as you were just lavishing upon her all the love and the adoration you could possibly give to her because that's how lovers are. Or maybe you remember the first time you looked into the face of that baby, <laughs> your own flesh and blood. You looked into that child's face and you suddenly fell head over heels in love. How much was too much to give to that kid? There was no such thing as too much of a good thing for that kid. There's no such thing as an excess for that kid. You would give anything because you were in love. For lovers, there is no such thing as excess. There is no such thing as too much of a good thing. That's what this description of heaven and the new Jerusalem is all about. Jesus is so much in love with you, he just can't give you enough. He's over the top with it because he's the lovesick groom longing for you. That's what's being painted here. That's how he feels about you. He's so much in love with you that he just can't help himself. He gives and he gives and he gives and then he gives some more. He is an extravagant lover. Remember, one of the Old Testament words for love is hesed. Hesed is a devoted love taken to a fever pitch of devotion. It is a love that borders on insanity. It is a love where the lover is consumed with thoughts of the beloved 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, possessed by thoughts of the beloved. The lover would do anything for the beloved. That word is only used for God's love for you, and that's what's be being described here. Jesus is crazy about you. He's over the top with giving to you. He's creating a city that's opulent. That's why when the bridegroom went to heaven to prepare a place for you, his chosen bride, he went more than a little overboard. He prepared a place that is so opulent that it will make you blush. He spared no expense. He stopped at nothing. Jesus showers you with an embarrassment of riches. I mean, why else would he use pure, transparent gold as paving stones? Why else would he prepare a mansion for you? Why would he prepare this city for you? Why would he give you walls that are jasper so brilliant and, and beautiful that it's transparent? A city that shines like gold, like transparent gold, like glass. Why would he do this? because he is the lovesick groom. He is a smitten lover, and he is smitten with you. He is the young groom who is embarrassingly giddy over his bride. Jesus can hardly wait for you to see the things he's prepared for you. He can hardly wait to bring you into his father's house so that you can live with him. That's the picture that John has painted for us. But the description is not over yet. Look at chapter 22, beginning with verse 1. Feel the emotion here. Experience the thrill as Jesus sends us a word picture of what his love has caused him to prepare, to prepare for his bride. Verse 1, then the angel showed me the river, the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. 
No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the, lamp of, the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Jesus is the lovesick groom. These passages reveal to us the heart of Jesus. We know his passion. His passion is you. We know his desire, his longing, his preoccupation. It is all for you. For you are a part of the group of people he calls his bride. Listen to the excitement in his voice. Verse 7 of chapter 22 says, Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. He repeats himself in verse 12. He says, Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. And yet again in verse 20, Jesus can scarcely contain himself. He says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. It is as though Jesus is the fiancé who's been separated from his lover. And he, he, he can't wait to get back, and so he writes her every day. But he hadn't got anything new to say. And so he says the same things. I'm going to see you soon, sweetheart. I'm coming. It won't be long now. We'll be together. i got some neat things for you. I can hardly wait. That's what this is about. Feel his passion for you. Feel his longing for you. Feel his enthusiasm about your soon arrival the house he's prepared for you. There are those who do not share the bridegroom's love. They've rejected their lovesick groom. Although the dowry has been paid and they legally belong to the bridegroom, they have played the harlot and they've chased after other gods, other lovers. But the bridegroom will never force anyone to come to the wedding feast. He will never force anyone to be his. He only wants those who freely, who freely choose to be a part of him. He does not force. But the lovesick God that we serve is so smitten by even those who have rejected him that he cannot end this book without one last appeal. One last time, listen to the pleading in his voice. Listen to the passion. Listen to the lovesick heart of the bridegroom. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Come. If you've not yet accepted the invitation of the bridegroom, what could be a better day than today to do that? He longs for you. He's so lovesick for you. He's prepared something that's just embarrassingly beautiful for you. He longs to shower on you the very best things he could possibly give. Why not surrender your heart to his great lovesick heart for you? Why not give yourself to the master? Accept the water of life today. You know when you do this, when you receive him, when you accept it, you'll feel the passion grow inside of you. You'll feel a longing for him it will grow inside of you. In fact, every day that you spend apart from him, you'll long for him more. You'll have him in your heart, in your prayers, and in your study, but every day you'll say, Lord, you know, heaven is pretty cool. You've got a lot of really neat things there, but that's not really what I want. I, I will enjoy them. What I want is you. What I want is you. Heaven's, heaven will be you, Lord. You can take away the streets of gold, the mansion, the city. You can take away it all. I just want you. Jesus is saying the same thing, but he says, you know what? You get it all. <laughs> you get me, and you get everything else. Like John, you will find yourself crying, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Lord Jesus, pray with me. Father, we've examined this book, and for those of us who have received you as Lord and Savior, there's nothing here to fear. In fact, there's a picture of you that is so beautiful, so appealing. 
we cannot resist it. Jesus, the lovesick groom who longs for us. Oh Lord, we look forward to the day when you come to take us home. We look forward to that day. And we claim you. We claim you as our groom. We are your bride. Now, Lord, come soon. For we pray to the name of Jesus. Amen. We would love to send you a free copy of Pastor Mike Tucker's book, Your Heart's Desire. This easy to read book illustrates God's longing for a relationship with you and how that can fulfill your ultimate heart's desire. Please contact us now for your free copy of Your Heart's Desire by calling toll free at 1-888-940-0062 or log on to our website, www.faithfortoday.tv. Does today's hectic lifestyle sometimes leave you feeling tired empty and missing out on what really counts in life? Do you crave fulfillment, yet nothing seems to satisfy that inner longing? Each week, the Faith for Today broadcast brings you hope, encouragement, and inspiration through music and a message especially designed to lift your spirits. If you love the broadcast, you'll love our website, faithfortoday.tv. Log on and watch this week's program or others in a series. Get a printed copy of this week's sermon, or you can order one of Pastor Mike Tucker's uplifting books. You can also keep abreast of happenings at Faith for Today, including discovering some of the ministry's other inspirational television programs. You may also become a part of Faith for Today by becoming a ministry partner. So go ahead, log on to faithfortoday.tv, a daily source of hope and inspiration. It's faith for you. Faith for Today, a place of grace. Heaven was very real to John, and you can almost hear the pleading in his voice as he concludes the book of Revelation. He says, even so, come quickly. You know, we echo that prayer. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We long for that day, don't we? Amen. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Faith for Today. Which way to turn? Down the one road lies all the world can offer. All its power, its wealth. Just a man with nail scars in his hands, but there is healing in his eyes, and there is power in his name. I choose Jesus, I choose Jesus without a solitary doubt. I choose Jesus. Cheese.